quote from the CBD COP15 here in Montreal, Canada. Today's event, Nature for All, empowering indigenous peoples and local communities to build and deliver a more effective national biodiversity strategies and action plans, and be hearing recommendations from Myanmar and the greater Mekong region. This event, we are trying to have the, is the ideal time to install an effective whole of society approach to the implementation of the global biodiversity framework and updating the national biodiversity strategies and action plans is one important one. So this side event will bring together indigenous peoples and local communities from across the wider greater Mekong region to learn from one another as they develop local action plans to protect, manage, and sustainably use biodiversity. This will serve to enhance implementation through participatory planning, knowledge management, and capacity building that supports the economic, environmental, and social well-being of all present and future citizens of the greater Mekong regions and the world. So thank you so much for joining us today. Before we start the event, I would like to have the statement. Due to the challenging operating context of Myanmar right now, and to best ensure the safety of all speakers returning to Myanmar, there will be no reference to the political context of the country in this session. Our audience, both online and in person here, are asked to bear this in mind when making comments or asking questions. We have an audience here in person and online. For those joining on Zoom, closed captions in Myanmar language are available. So please select that option if you would like it. Also, for those joining via Zoom, a colleague will collect the questions posed and feed these through to me. So please do put your questions in the Q&A function. So we have an, uh, a very distinguished panel with us here today. We will have um, Rashin joining us a bit later. Instead of the opening, we will have uh, the speaker at the end because he's having some difficulty connecting online. So we will start with, um, I'll still give his introduction. Rashin Salagnan is a project management specialist Regional Environment Office from the USAID Regional Development Mission for Asia, who will be joining us virtually. Our second speaker is Stuart, the Chairman of All Burma Indigenous Peoples Alliance from Myanmar, and he's here with us in person. Stuart is an Indigenous leader and the advocates for the rights of the Indigenous peoples across Myanmar. He's also an environmental defender, activist, and researcher. He, along with his team, advocates recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples at local, national, regional, and international levels through various platforms. Our next speaker, Stoney, Program Coordinator and Promotion of Indigenous Peoples and Nature Together, Point, Myanmar. Stewart works as a Program Coordinator at Point, promoting the rights of indigenous peoples supporting capacity building of indigenous leaders to protect their substantial rights provided by the UN Declaration of the Rights on Indigenous Peoples, the UN DRIP, working on ad policy advocacy for the recognition and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples, including customary land tenure and their role in environmental conservation. Our next speaker, Ombon Tipsuna, is the president Association of Northeast Thailand Community Network, and who has also joined us online. So she is going to be joining us from Thailand. Our next speaker is Naimi Oshwe, Dr. Naimi Oshwe, Head of Wildlife Program, WWF Myanmar, who's also joined us here in person. Head of WWF Myanmar Wildlife Program, leading species conservation, ecology and research, community-based wildlife conservation, citizen science, and a biodiversity hero projects. And working in biodiversity conservations are area-based, landscape, and regional levels. So thank you so much for, uh, for all of you for being here, including our, um, on our panels who are joining us in, in, uh, from, from various um, other places. 
So without further ado, uh, we will go straight to the questions. Um, okay, so I would want to ask um, with um, Rashane, or oh, Rashane is not here, sorry, Stuart. Um, I would really like to know from you is, could you share with us one or two examples of how indigenous peoples led conservation or community-based conservation uh, in your work? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thanks to the organizer, WWF Nyamr, and friends here. Uh, <clears throat> I think we, when we talk about uh, indigenous conserved, uh, community conserved areas in Myanmar, I think we need to also bring about the uh, picture of the indigenous peoples in context in Myanmar. Uh, first, I think, uh, as I said, uh, the indigenous peoples in Myanmar are not uh, legally uh, recognized, and there is no legal protection from the government, which is a very sad part. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, the other funny thing that we see is also uh, the Myanmar as a government consented to UN DRIP, but uh, back home it is not implemented. And uh, uh, even though there is no recognition from the government, uh, the indigenous communities have been in Myanmar since time immemorial for millennia. And they have been doing uh, community conservations, biodiversity conservations, environmental conservations in different forms. Indigenous peoples in Myanmar occupy uh, from alpine, hill regions, tropical, subtropical, and coastal areas. And uh, <clears throat> Like, if we look at uh, the uh, biodiversity in Myanmar, 80% of it falls under the management of uh, uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, existence of uh, biodiversity in Myanmar is a proof that there is a strong management of the indigenous peoples over the natural resources and their territories. Samples that we can see here, I have put up uh, this uh, Salem Peace Park. It's, a, uh, it's an award-winning uh, ICCA in, in Myanmar and also in Mekong region. So in this, you will see how indigenous communities in Myanmar manage their uh, forests, their biodiversity, their environment. And I will not go deep uh, into that since I'm or like uh, you can see the pictures and information embedded in it also. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. No, Stuart, thank you very much. I think one key element we are here, you know, this is a historic moment, right? We are here, we're having this event at the COP15 here in Montreal that mm. is working to adopt a blueprint for conservation or nature, right? Like the 30 years blueprint. And I think the discussion around is that, that you're talking about the recognition. So however, though there are, could be you know, bigger policies and stuff, but at the crust of it, it's what really comes down at the national level. And I think that has also been a challenge. You're talking about the you know, UN DRIP adopted in September 2017 is, is quite old. Uh, but also saying that you know, the recognition is what's really important um, at, at, um, at the national level to ensure that indigenous people's governance um, is recognized. So thank you so much. So Stoney, I'm again going to you with the next question is from your experience and the work that you're doing, could you share some examples? Yes, uh, thank you everyone and thanks for these good opportunities. Uh, let me start with saying uh, indigenous knowledge is uh, the community-based conservation itself because when saying is that uh, our practice, uh, the way we live, our way of uh, life, and then our subsistence for livelihood uh, is uh, never meant to kind of harm the ecosystems nor exploitation of it, but to keep balance and harmony. Because the indigenous peoples never take from nature and mother earth more than they need it. 
And it did also realize that today, uh, the indigenous peoples are the custodians of the biodiversities and uh, environment. But uh, my colleague also already said, is funny and sadly, uh, the way our practice, our customer tenure, uh, being indigenous people is not recognized. And uh, our customer practice shifting cultivation such as uh, they are not, they, they are kind of seen as like uh, outdated style which destroy the ecosystem and cause de deforestation. But in fact, shifting cultivation has been uh, practiced since our um, ancestor, since immemorial time, and it is our uh, main source of our livelihood. And today, the world also uh, show that, the records show that most of biodiversity are within our indigenous people's area. But because in shifting cultivation, there's a good practice such as not cutting down big trees from the bottom so that it can generate a new branch and life. And shifting cultivation itself is the key to uh, conservation of seeds, life, and uh, the tradition, cultures, and the traditional knowledge of indigenous people. But today, uh, the, uh, our way of practice, our customary tenure, has been facing many challenges and obstacles because it is not recognized and protected. It's facing uh, outsider, many outsider pressures and also assimilation by statutory law and off by uh, conflict. So that it has struggled from keeping the good practice, the value that we have to the natures and to the environment. And for us nowadays, it is needed to support and to promote the indigenous people to restoration of its own self ownerships and so that they can protect their environment, their territory, and uh, they can gain on, uh, a certain benefit sharing from it. And meanwhile, we need to conduct evidence-based documentations uh, to regard good practices, and we need to also do campaign to promote the sense of ownerships and conduct awareness raisings and promotion of the capacity of indigenous peoples, leaders uh, on the rights of UN drifts and self-determinations so that they can prevent from exploitations of uh, their genetic resource, they can protect themselves, and also they can gain uh, they can ensure the access and benefit sharing. If indigenous people lost their way of sense and ownerships over their territory, there is no hope for conservation and no hope for mitigation of climate change and all. The conservation of forest and biodiversity can only be achieved with the full participation of indigenous people. Yeah, thank you. Stoney, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I think this is, an, again, a really very important aspect that you talked about, is about you know, recognizing the practices of indigenous peoples and the traditional knowledge. And I think this is also what we've been discussing here at the COP, saying that you know, scientific knowledge is important, but it needs to go in hand in hand with the traditional knowledge and practices. I mean, they must be doing something right over these years that the world's richest biodiversity ecosystems are found in their areas. I mean, there has to be something right. Maybe not scientific, but the way the holistical relationship that indigenous peoples have with the ecosystems and nature. I think that's a very important point for us to also keep reminding ourselves that it's not only about numbers, it's not only about science, but it's also about collaborations and recognizing and giving due respect to those knowledge systems and practices. Next, um, I will reach out to Omborn online. Um, Omborn Sawadika uh, from Montreal, thank you so much for joining us and it's late in Thailand. So from your experience and the work that you're doing, could you share your experiences? 
Thank you. สวัสดีค่ะออมบุญพิสุนาจากไทยแลนด์ค่ะในสไลด์จะเห็นว่าพื้นที่จุดสีแดงๆที่พวกเราอยู่เนี่ยอยู่ในภาคอีสานของประเทศไทยห่างจากเขื่อนจีนประมาณ 1,500 กิโลเมตรแล้วก็ห่างจากเขื่อนลาวประมาณ300กิโลเมตรพวกเราได้รับผลกระทบจากการสร้างเขื่อนในแม่น้ำโขงสายหลักแล้วก็การเปลี่ยนแปลงของสภาวะภูมิอากาศโลกรวมทั้งโครงการพัฒนาต่างๆที่ถังถมเข้ามาในรุ่มน้ำโขงสิ่งที่พวกเราได้กระทบเนี่ยเจอเราเจอปัญหาทั้งในเรื่องของความหนักหนายทางเชื้อภาพที่ลดลงนะคะความมั่นคงทางอาหารที่หายไปพันธุ์พืชพันธุ์ป่าที่หายไปรวมทั้งการเปลี่ยนแปลงสภาพนิเวศจอยในแม่น้ําโขงซึ่งส่งผลกระทบต่อความมั่นคงทางอาหารต่อวิถีชีวิตต่อประเพณีวัฒนธรรมของชุมชนริมโขงในส่วนของภาคอีสานเนี่ยของประเทศไทยเนี่ยเป็นอย่างมาก next slide please สิ่งเหล่านี้เนี่ยทำให้ชุมชนเครือข่ายที่พวกเราทำงานอยู่ในเขตพื้นที่7จังหวัดภาคอีสานเนี่ยร่วมกันหาทางออกเพื่อที่จะแก้ไขปัญหาซึ่งแน่นอนนะคะว่าจะต้องรับรู้สถานการณ์ด้วยการศึกษาเรียนรู้ปัจจัยในส่วนที่เกี่ยวข้องทั้งหมดนะคะซึ่งใน15ปีที่ผ่านมาเราได้ทำงานวิจัยนะคะไทยบ้านส่งเสริมให้ชาวบ้านสำรวจสภาพนิเวศที่เปลี่ยนแปลงไปอะไรบ้างที่เหมือนเดิมอะไรบ้างที่เปลี่ยนแปลงไปนะคะก็ทำงานวิจัยกับชุมชนทั้งหมดในเขตพื้นที่7จังหวัดเนี่ยประมาณ12แห่งนะคะแล้วก็ได้เริ่มทำเขตอนุรักษ์นะคะทรัพยากรสัตว์น้ำเนี่ยในช่วงปี2019ถึง2022เนี่ยทั้งหมด23แห่งสิ่งต่างๆเหล่านี้เนี่ยเราได้เริ่มต้นในการศึกษาสำรวจผลกระทบทั้งในระบบนิเวศย่อยในแม่น้ำโขงแล้วก็แหล่งน้ำในชุมชนสำรวจทรัพยากรของชุมชนและชุมชนมีอะไรบ้างทั้งหมดนี้ทำด้วยตัวของชุมชนเองเขาจะเป็นคนที่รู้สถานการณ์ปัญหาในชุมชนของเขาแล้วเขาก็จะเป็นคัดเลือกว่าคนคัดเลือกว่าพื้นที่ตรงไหนเหมาะที่จะพื้นฟูพื้นที่ตรงไหนเหมาะที่จะทํากิจกรรมการพัฒนานะคะเขามีการปรึกษาหารือในการทํางานมีการจัดเวทีประชาคมหมู่บ้านตัดสินใจที่จะทําเรื่องเขตรักปลาการปลูกพืชพื้นถิ่นเพื่อสร้างแหล่งที่อยู่อาศัยสร้างบ้านให้กับปลาประสานหน่วยงานที่เกี่ยวข้องโดยเฉพาะกรมประมงเพื่อขอสนับสนุนพันธุ์ปลาเพื่อมาปล่อยในพื้นที่ที่เขาทําเขตรู้ละทําปุ๋ยอินทรีย์ปลูกผักพืชผักสวนครัวซึ่งทั้งหมดเนี่ยเป็นสิ่งที่พวกเราทําในระบบนิเวศที่แตกต่างกันที่ชุมชนมีความรู้เฉพาะท้องถิ่นและมีรูปแบบการทํางานที่แตกต่างกัน Thank you Thank you Thank you so much um, k u n a m p o n for for also sharing the experiences of what they've been doing And I think these are all great examples saying that communities are already doing a lot of work on the ground. What's really needed is for them to have ensure that enabling environments are there for them to continue doing that work, but also ensuring that they have a right to just decide, have their self determination, and other rights associated. Um, next, I'm going to go to n e m i o to share with your experience. One or two examples of community-led conservation. Um, thanks, Tina. Um, yeah, in here I would like to highlight uh, two different topics. One is uh, how indigenous community are important in to achieve the global biodiversity framework, and second one is uh, what we are uh, doing in currently. So in uh, the biodiversity conservation, definitely the community-based conservation. Is important, especially uh, ICCA, Indigenous Community Conserve Area, Community Conserve Area, and OECM. So, such type of the um, activity uh, uh, is mainly by the local communities and local indigenous groups. So, in this case, um, the importance to achieve the post 2020 biodiversity framework without. Uh, the uh, indigenous community and local community. Um, and for second one, uh, there's a no doubt most of the key uh, biodiversity area is within the indigenous community 
area. So in, in this case, uh, definitely free prior informed consent is uh, required in, in, the, in the country. Um, and also the respect in their uh, customary rights. That is a, a major important what in the IMP at LC area. Uh, for in, in what currently what we do uh, is we have a community-based conservation, um, like an inclusive whole of society approach, including the local community and indigenous people and youths, women, uh, everyone have included in the biodiversity uh, conservation. That is a very big crucial. Um, currently, we have a uh, community-based conservation, we call the citizen science and biodiversity hero. We have series of biodiversity training to the local community and also they conserve by themselves in their own area. That is a very important for the resource ownership in the current content. Um, uh, we have in longer term, um, we said they how to be best support of the uh, bottom-up approach of the a national biodiversity strategy action plan. That is also will be the more important for the country in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, no, thank you so very much. I think again, these are the uh, key, very relevant discussions um, to also put into the COP15 and hopefully they will be reflected in the, in the decisions, relevant decisions. As we all know, the NBSAP is a key element that will set the stage of how countries will be operationalizing the vision of the post-2020 at the national level. So it's a very key document, and I think one of the, also the element about that is how will they report on that. So you also have the monitoring framework to go with it. So this is a very important thing, and we talk about the whole of society, and that's what we are looking at. You know, The GBF is supposed to be this vision of the whole of society approach, and in that we need to make sure that the rights holders are not left behind, and to ensure that you know, uh, when you're actually saying that, we also need to make sure that we stay by, stand by our words. Um, I think um, we have Rashani online, but maybe we can wait, but I will, um, Okay, I'm going to uh, you know, change the session into like first, I'll finish with your recommendations. Uh, now moving forward, um, Stuart, I want to ask you, so looking at these examples, we share some really good examples for the audiences to understand and see, um, and you are here, you're representing your communities here, uh, of what you're saying, so you have this ownership of these. So what would your recommendation be to people, uh, you know, agencies, parties, uh, civil society, media here, indigenous peoples, like what is needed for an inclusive GBF? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, speak on this in terms of uh, way forward, what we can do and uh, uh, what we should be doing. Yeah, now if, as we talk about uh, the ICCAs and biodiversity conservation in in the context of Myanmar, I think we should never forget uh, what is happening in Myanmar. So with this coup in place, as we all know, uh, before I talk about biodiversity conservation again, let me go back to what indigenous peoples are and what they're going through, yeah? After the coup, our territories, indigenous territories have, have been turned into killing zone and you know what? As we talk over here, you know, as we speak of their lives and uh, what they have been doing, their contribution, our peoples are running for their lives. And with this situation, with this condition, uh, we talk about over here, MBSAP strategy, targets, and all, you know, I don't think it is really uh, something practical that I can see for the future of Myanmar with this situation as it, if it continues. So I would like to request the international community to uh, help us to overcome this coup in a way you can. And uh, also, and in the future, uh, like the recommendations that we look, we are of course still hopeful, we are in a terrible situation, uh, but uh, we are hopeful that we'll be able to overcome soon with your sympathy, with your assistance, you know. And uh, 
what I see, like uh, the, rec uh, the recognition of indigenous peoples, yeah, and their rights, I think that plays the fundamental part. Uh, and also, as uh, w when we talk about this, uh, I think it is very much important to look at uh, the constitutional reform, uh, kind of, uh, the legal reform, you know, that really ensures, you know, their status and their, uh, you know, I mean, this is something, you know, a process to rehumanize, you know. Our indigenous peoples in Myanmar have been dehumanized even though their contributions have been so big. So it's a process to rehumanize them, you know. And also, the international community and uh, INGOs. Let us not go by, you know, just to fulfill the project goals, you know. For example, like MBSAP uh, plan uh, target, you know, like 30%, you know. Let's not go for that, you know. It, it, let's also focus on uh, the, the real people, yeah, the real guardians, you know, who are really uh, in charge of that. Now, as said, as mentioned earlier, these real guardians are running for their lives. What can we expect, you know? That's a big question for us. And if we want to talk about the recognition of, uh, I mean, the reaching, the MBSAPs, you know, like beautiful speeches here we hear, uh, you know, from COP event, uh, many other international events, you know. I think if we don't look at those important aspects, I think we are going nowhere. This is something important that I see. And also, I think that uh, we need to do a serious educational reform, yeah? In the schools, what we are being taught, you know, it is about capitalist values. There is no nothing about uh, our indigenous values, you know. And this indigenous values, indigenous knowledge to be taught in the school is not just for the indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, you know. It's also for the peoples and kids in the city because most of the policy makers from, uh, from cities and from urban areas, you know, they are doing a lot of policies and decisions which are bullshit, yeah, you know. And they are destroying, you know, these policies, these laws are destroying. And they're not only indigenous peoples, they are also destroying the, themselves and destroying the whole planet, you know. So we need to bring these important aspects into our education so that our kids can be educated and taught in such a way that they really care in word and in deed. I think this is something important uh, for us. And if we, like I said, even our like INGOs and international community, you know, we really look for that. We would really expect your help to make it happen a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those powerful words. And I think, again, a reminder, we are in this crucial moment here and how do we really make sure that this actually means what they're aspiring for is living in harmony with nature. And that cannot happen if you again have a framework that is going to take away and exacerbate the human rights values of like indigenous peoples and the rights holders. And I think what you talked about, I really like this, and I'm going to maybe uh, you be using it, is this dehumanize and rehumanize. You know, for people who are here, I don't know if you're aware of what's happening on that side we're talking about, is there is a lot of migration and conflict and killings happening. But saying that dehumanize, like I think all of you both shared about, is that dehumanizing indigenous people's practices, like, you know, you always seen as, uh, you know, practices not being um, uh, scientific enough or not recognizing customary um, ways of indigenous peoples and their knowledge. So thank you so much uh, for that. Also food for thought for all of you who are here and hope to also reach to parties, hopefully, because this is really very important. Uh, this is not only about nature, it's about ensuring that what we are doing does not exacerbate more inequalities in the world. Now, next, the same question uh, to Stoney Yu. We shared the good practices. It looks really very good. But now is the time to share your recommendations of what you're expecting of the GBF from here, COP15. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, my colleagues have already given really good comment already. And I will also like the opportunity for being here. So my recommendation is I would like to give in 
three S for em emphasizing three S. The first is that strengthening FBIC, and the second is that stronger participation of indigenous people. The third one is that strategic planning for implementation. When saying is that FPIC, FPIC, when FPIC must be uh, conduct and implement for every activities such as development project, including designation of pro protected area. And currently the country is in chaos and designation of protected area must stop. It will not help any uh, conservation of and protected area. In the second, strengthening and recognition of customary land tenures and land use for sustainable livelihood. Designation of this uh, protected area is no conservation at all. For conservation is required, community participation. And for community participation, it needs to conduct FPIC and it needs to be ensured. And the third one is that strategic planning for strategic implementation for, of biodiversity conservations, which include uh, inclusion of uh, indigenous peoples in the uh, project. The last, not the least, we need peace. Without peace, there cannot be any conservations and there can be no harmony of life and for nature. So that I are to uh, every state members, stakeholders, agency, to put your available time to save life and nature and to work on your utmost to end conflict and to build peace and reconciliations. Thank you. Thank you, Stoney, again for another very strong messaging saying that the aspirations that are being set out here, the prerequisite for it is peace. Um, to ensure that, that we have peaceful societies first before we do anything else. So thank you for, again for another very strong messaging. Um, I'll turn to uh, you on porn, um, uh, on, online. Um, if, what, did, what would be your recommendations um, for the outcomes of the COP15 here in Montreal? Thank you. เอ่อสิ่งที่คิดว่าสําคัญที่สุดในการสร้างเสริมความเข้มแข็งแล้วก็สนับสนุนให้ชุมชนในท้องถิ่นได้ทํางานก็คืออย่างเข้มแข็ง
And also important, uh, important is to have, first is to have access to information. If you don't have information, then it's also very difficult to, um, I mean, what their experience has been working together, um, negotiating, and also ensuring that there is enabling environments for us, for all of us to do so. So thank you so very much. Um, before I, so we have Roshni online, but before I go to him, I want to again um, acknowledge and present it again here, saying um, due to the challenges operating context in Myanmar right now, and to best ensure the safety of all speakers returning to, uh, to Myanmar, there will be no references to the political context of the country in this, um, in this session. So after we will be having a Q&A, um, I would really ask you to remind you of being um, aware and um, we will also be, uh, we'll see how much time is left, but we'll also prioritize taking questions from our online participants first. And if we have time permits, all of you are here in person, so please feel free to also reach all our panelists after the event. Um, next, um, I'm going to again bring back, bring back uh, Rashen Sala Nan, I think it's online. Uh, is the project management specialist for the Regional Environment Office, USAID, Regional Development Mission for Asia. And also, I would like to also acknowledge that today's event um, is supported by USAID. So, uh, Rashane is also joining online uh, to you. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Hi, um, no, I just want to thank you, um, um, the moderator and also the speakers uh, as well. Um, I apologize that I could not join you earlier to give my opening remarks uh, due to some technical issues, but um, I'm here now and I want to commend the speakers. Um, it's a passionate um, speeches um, and information that they have shared. Um, our colleague um, Kun Ambun, um, Stoney, and um, the rest of the speakers. Um, yes, and 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 there has been um, conclusions or recommendations that has been discussed already. But obviously, um, conservation and reversal of um, the destruction of the nature in um, several areas um, in, in in nature, and it's um, it's really hard not to. Um, work with indig indigenous people who who have the know-how uh, of the local, the local know-how, and have been working in that area to conserve the nature. Um, and most of the time, is um, better conserved than having the public or private um, actors um, doing it. So it's. Uh, quite astonishing that we have not been involving the indigenous people and the local communities enough in the um, discussion and um, the solution going forward. So this um, session is a good opportunity to, to do that, to remind ourselves of that again, and to try to identify what is um, the international communities um, can um, lend a hand to indigenous, indigenous um, uh, communities. Um, I just want to emphasize that um, USAID, along with um, the partner um, WWF, we um, stand close to um, indigenous people and local communities, and we want to um, provide support uh, where we can in, in order to help um, conserve the nature together. So um, just to want to end with um, the fact that, but before we looking at the conservation of the nature, as um, the colleagues mentioned, perhaps um, security is something that um, we have to uh, ensure um, that it exists first before we move on to conserve the nature, because why would we conserve the nature if we have no um, people living in it? So thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And I think again, saying that um, conservation will also be efforts will be effortless if people are not there. Um, so thank you so much for also another strong messaging there. Um, I'm, um, I'm going to open the floor, and there is a question from our colleagues who have joined us online. I'm going to take that one first. Um, 
I think you'll also, uh, Nemi, I think it's also directed to you in a way that you'll be talking about the NBSAP. So as uh, we were talking about that NBSAP is going to be a key instrument to be um, you know, bringing uh, home the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So the question is that, that the current NBSAP actually uh, was only from 2015 to 2020, um, and it needs to be also been, uh, be, uh, be updated. So the question is that, if so, What's your recommendation for the NBSAP for adaptation currently, for conservation, use, and equitable benefit sharing? So um, I'll go with you, Naomi, because you've been working on that, and maybe from Stoney and Stuart, of what do you see how you could be part of the NBSAP at the national level? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, before going to the NBSAP, um, I would like to slightly highlight about the 3030 goals. That is a very good discussion in here, that scientists say 3030 is only the minimum requirement. So I'm talking about that this global event, I'm not specific about the Myanmar situation. So that is a main discussion point you can hear in the opening speech about the minimum requirement, because we are trying to conserve the mother earth. We have a lot of biodiversity loss day to day, so that's why more ambitious target is required to save the mother earth. That is the one main uh, uh, requirement trying to clear. And secondly, yet, uh, current ambitious is already uh, over and the time to move. But in here, I would say bottom up, not from the top down. Bottom up means we have to make concert with the several key stakeholders, right holder, indigenous community, youth, women, everything, all inclusive in there. That is the one I would like to highlight. So definitely, MBCF is a requirement in the country. And in accordance with the, the CVD event, a lot of people raise about the MBCF. But in Myanmar space space, bottom up is very important. That is the one I would like to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Stoney, would you have a recommendation how to make, how to make the NBSAP a bit more stronger, like um, how would you want to be part of that, if that helps? The national biodiversity strategies and action plans. What message would you give? Is what is needed to make sure that the strategies are inclusive? Uh, I have only one concern, because under the NDSF and NDC, uh, there was a lot of the uh, green grabbing before, and then. Uh, I was just only concerned that in the implementation of 3030, uh, it needs uh, the real recognition and uh, participation of the indigenous people. Yeah. Uh, Stuart, you? Uh, actually, I'm confused with uh, MBSAP target <laughs> and uh, what is happening now. Yeah, because uh, like, uh, Looking at the context, uh, for example, 30% uh, yeah, is the MBSAP. Uh, and meanwhile, on the ground, uh, like uh, our indigenous territories or like biodiversity hotspots are turning into uh, mining sites also, you know, on the one hand. So I can see here the double standard from the government itself, you know, that's really funny, but uh, I don't know how it is going on, you know. And also, uh, yeah, of course, to reach that target, it is first and foremost important thing is uh, the recognition of uh, indigenous peoples. I think this plays uh, the fundamental. And uh, also <clears throat> the uh, indigenous governance system uh, that has to be uh, recognized in full fledged. Uh, that, that cannot, uh, I mean, that cannot uh, go, go, you know, like patchy and selective, as my colleague uh, Stoney was saying, you know, the the importance of shifting cultivation, yeah? Like in our context, we call Zoom, yeah? So um, Zoom is actually the keystone of that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, ecosystem in indigenous communities, especially in the Mekong region, if we look at it, you know? But without recogni re recognizing it, you know? Because indigenous system is, uh, is a package, yeah? It is not uh, like a capitalistic uh, robotic system. You know, it's very different, yeah? So it has to come with a 
uh, with a package as uh, indigenous uh, governance system. And without looking those things, without uh, touching those things, I don't think uh, this MBSAP target will be fulfilled. I think it'll just go in thin air. That's what I see. Thank you. Uh, no, very relevant points. I think what you're talking about is looking at a holistic approach, not by piece by piece. And uh, totally understand that it has to be a bottom-up approach to make it more inclusive. Like, you need to make sure that all, the whole of society, are part of the NBSAB. But also taking this opportunity to say that, you know, uh, maybe I'm also stressing it a bit, but saying that, we have to be cautious of what the target three on 30 by 30 and how it's going to be implemented. There was a problem with the ISHA target on protected areas. Now we are expanding it way beyond that from 17 to 30 percent. And how can we then now again ensure that um, the uh, indigenous peoples are able to uh, retain their little rights that they already have and are still having conflicts, right? So I think a reminder for all of us is when we are asking for something is to look at the holistic approach of the social, economic, cultural impacts um, of all these asks here, which are very easily aspirational, but should also be, also be grounded in the ground realities that communities are facing on the ground. Um, and I think NBSAP could possibly be a process, but hopefully it's going to be a bit more bottom approach and a truly transformative um, NBSAP and hopefully the outcome of the COP15. Um, thank you so, uh, so very much. Uh, we have about five more minutes. Um, um, let me just check if there is any other, any other questions. Um, okay, on, on the ending one, I would also ask now, I think we only have five minutes, so I'll just go to the closing, if that's okay. Um, Nemio, what, from, from yours uh, perspective, and, and, and again, this amazing platform here, um, what would you say, like, I'm gonna give the closing remarks, just, uh, substantive ways for the international community um, could support indigenous peoples and local communities? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's why I'm, um, I'm, I would like to highlight again about the, um, the mother art issue that a lot of people, that's why we all are in here about two weeks, discuss, debate, talking about the how we can uh, conserve our nature. So we're facing a lot of biodiversity loss. We're facing the several uh, deforestation, forest degradation in every well of the world. So we're trying to conserve the nature, harmony with the indigenous people. I'm no doubt that is an indigenous people roles and responsible. It's very much important to conserve the uh, mother art. So that is first, first one I would like to say. Um, no possibility of achieving the global goal of 30 by 30 or whatever numerical digits in there. So definitely without equitability of the partnership with the IPLLC, we cannot achieve under this global goal. There's no doubt or question. Um, for secondly, effort, definitely uh, our college um, Stoney already mentioned, important. Not only on paper, just we need to apply the effort properly in whatever the effort development in the indigenous area. I tr uh, truly agree on this point. Um, and also the and we said again, that is a, uh, the, the requirement. We people that like a, in the global level, people are trying to commit on to conserve properly by the national biodiversity strategy and action plan. So we, in, in our country case, already is been since two years, but we, that is the time. I mean, uh, I'm not saying this is the right time or not with the bottom up, uh, but that is a country requirement of the uh, MBSET in the country and whole society approach, definitely that is a more important to develop the, uh, the ambitious book. That is a process is more uh, important in this case. Um, I'm, I'm fully agree that peaceful society is a prerequisite. We have a lot of challenging on that. Um, and sure the meaningful and inclusive implementation, that is I want to highlight about the 2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. Everyone 
right? To live in harmony with nature and also no one left it behind. That is the one I would like to make a uh, call to the international audience. We'll, the special attention in this case request to all international audience. We, trying, we are trying to uh, reverse the biodiversity loss in the country, in Myanmar. We need, your, we need your help and not forget Myanmar. And thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, we only have time for this much. Thank you for all the um, speakers' panels online, the panels, also the participants. Thank you so very much. We will close on this side. And also for all our audiences, um, we, you all, thank you so much for taking the time to come so early. We do have some coffee, water, snacks on the side, so please help yourselves. But also, please take the opportunity to get and meet uh, the speakers on the panel to really understand, know their stories, connect with them. So once again, um, also thanking USAID for supporting this event and, of course, in collaboration with WWF. And thank you so much for all the panelists and for the audience. Have a good day and good luck in the negotiations. Thank you all.